Uh, to Westfield, we're ready to start whenever y'all are ready. Um, okay. Are the judges ready? Um, I am. I'm ready. Okay. Then if everybody is ready, let's begin. Winnegate resolved the United States should remove nearly all of its military presence from the Arab states of the Persian Gulf. Contention one is Iran will fill in the power vacuum. Iran is inherently expansionist. Matanka 20 of the Middle East Institute explains that expansionist ethos is part of Iran's DNA. Arabi of the Institute for Global Change furthers in 2020 that expansionist jihad is literally written into the Iranian constitution. Fortunately, American military presence in the region is key to containing Iranian expansion. Piven of Al Jazeera reports in 2012, US military bases continue to form a strategic envelope around Iran. These forces both deter Iranian proxy warfare and militarily engage Iranian-backed militia forces. If the US leaves, Iran will step into the power vacuum and take control of the Middle East. Batanka of the Middle East Institute continues that Iran's strategy rests in large part on its ability to capitalize on power vacuum. We saw this empirically in Iraq. Arango of the New York Times explains that when the US partially withdrew from Iraq, Iran stepped into the power vacuum, creating ties with regional Iraqi actors by making the case that it is Iraq's only reliable defender. Even worse, Iran-backed Shia militias have begun organizing themselves politically for dominance over Iraq's political system. Arango concludes, Iran dominated in Iraq after the US handed the country over. Allowing Iran to rule the Middle East is bad for three reasons. First, Iran encourages ethnic cleansings. Abdul Razak of the Middle East Monitor writes in 2016, Iran sanctioned sectarian and ethnic cleansing can be seen clearly in places such as Samarra and Iraq, where Sunnis are being driven out in order to create geniusly Shia zones and safe corridors that stretch from Iran and pass through Iraq and on into Syria. Second, Iran supports brutal dictatorships. For example, Tadonio of PBS writes in 2018, Iran's support for the Assad regime has helped fuel one of the most brutal wars in modern times. Third, Irani Iran uses terrorism to destabilize other countries so it can expand its own influence. Radio Free Europe writes in 2019, Iran remains the world's most worst state sponsor of terrorism at nearly $1 billion annually. Posey of the Daily Signal explains in 2017 that Iran has a long history of backing rebel groups and undermining established regional governments. Contention two is Israel's genocide against Palestinians. CCR explains in 2016 that in Palestine, Israel has worked to ruthlessly implement a systematic campaign to destroy the Palestinian people, which has killed thousands of Palestinians and has reached the level of genocide. U.S. withdrawal drastically worsens this genocide in Palestine for three reasons. First, that U.S. withdrawal creates a perception of insecurity and fuels hardline policies. Al Monitor explains in 2019 that U.S. withdrawal from the Middle East makes Iran feel like they are abandoned and have been left on their own to deal with the powerful Turkish-Russian-Iranian axis. This is problematic because Sarto of Georgetown explains in 2017 that Israeli hardliners use the politics of insecurity in order to justify a no-compromise approach to security in the Palestinians. Israelis will not respond to insecurity by pursuing peace. Haaretz explains in 2017 that Israel has a long history of anti-Semitic persecution. Two particularly strong memories are the Holocaust and the Yom Kippur War, where five Arab nations invaded Israel's territory on the day that Israel was founded. That's why insecurity in Israel always results in increased securitization. Second is that a U.S. withdrawal will help Netanyahu win his upcoming election. Netanyahu is the perfect politician to capitalize on insecurity. Haaretz explains in 2017 that Netanyahu has held on to power by promoting a narrative that Israel faces an existential threat from Iran. This only increases the motivation to vote for a young man hardliner like Netanyahu. Netanyahu winning is terrible because he has explicitly called for the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza. Third, withdrawing forces destroys any chance of peace in Palestine. Halfinger of the New York Times explains that U.S. efforts to advance a peace process depend on leverage with Israel. U.S. withdrawal destroys is that leverage because the U.S. is no longer defending Israel against Iran. Halfinger explains that without that strong opposition to Iran, the peace process will be at risk, ultimately concluding, if you're in favor of peace between Israel and the Palestinians, you've got to be in favor of a strong U.S. policy toward Iran. Thus, we are proud to negate. Um, can I call for any cards for that any say cards that, that right say now, right um, now, um, right now, like an Israel Palestine, like Israel Palestine peace process is happening and is successful? No, we our card just says that any chance of a peace process is jeopardized. We don't read okay. that it's happening right now. Okay. <laughs>
Yeah. Is everybody ready? Awesome. Foothill affirms, our first contention is Iraq. Karam19 says that the Iranian-backed Iraqi militias want U.S. troops to leave Iraq because they view U.S. presence as a Western interventionism. Thus, Smith, this March, writes that these Iraq militias have increased threats to directly attack U.S. troops unless the U.S. pulls out of the region. These threats have materialized recently as conflict has escalated between the U.S. and Iran-backed militias. In March, Memori20 reports that the U.S. launched airstrikes on militia bases, and Lovelock20 continues that the militias have increased aggression against U.S. troops in Iraq with frequent rocket strikes. These strikes have the potential to spark cyclical violence in the region. And on April 6th, Kulub 20 reports that three rockets landed near a U.S. oil field in Iraq, only serving to further escalate tensions. Thus, Cooper 20 concludes that Iranian-backed militias are trying to provoke the U.S. into a conflict that could prompt Iraq to evict the remaining U.S. troops in the region. In fact, Mazzetti 20 reports I'm hearing an echo. Mazzetti, Mazzetti 20 reports that the Pentagon has ordered the creation of war plans to escalate U.S. combat in Iraq, with Pompeo and O'Brien already pushing for increased aggression against the Iranian militias. Fortunately, Kent 20 writes that withdrawing U.S. troops would calm the situation because the Iranian-backed militias would have accomplished their goal of a U.S. eviction, thus preventing further escalation. However, if escalation continues, this would result in military conflict in Iraq, which Nicholas 18 quantifies would kill 2.4 million people. Contention two is Iran. U.S.-Iran tensions have reached a boiling point. Manson 20 reports that the U.S. killed Soleimani, Iran's military commander, in January. In March, proxy forces launched a rocket attack on an Iraqi base, killing U.S. troops. And a few days later, BBC reports that the U.S. launched retaliatory airstrikes against an Iran militia group in Iraq. The recent coronavirus crisis has only increased the risk of escalation, as Hussein 20 explains that Iran's determination to retaliate against the U.S., regardless of its people's suffering, illustrates that Iran shows no sign of relenting on what they view as their primary geopolitical interest of ejecting U.S. troops from Iraq. Iran is bound to strike U.S. troops in the region. Milani 20 explains that hardliners control almost all key levers of power in Iran and have a good chance of winning the 2021 presidential election. Hardliners cite U.S. presence as a threat to Iran's regime. As Kareem 17 writes that hardliners believe the U.S. has been committed to the overthrow of Iran since its inception. Thus, hardliners are the most listened to in Iran's government because the U.S. has increased its presence, which fits their narrative of a U.S. threat. Marek 19 says that maximum pressure on Iran is undermining the moderate government, undercutting efforts to hamper hardliners itching for war. And this justifies expansion, as Jones 11 explains that surrounding Iran militarily and putting it under the constant threat of the U.S. military has strengthened hardliners and convinced them that the best path to self-preservation is defiance and militarism. Absent U.S. presence, hardliners lose the influence they currently have in Iran as they can no longer scapegoat the U.S. as a major threat to this regime. Instead, Sara 19 writes that moderates in Iran want to find a peaceful resolution in the form of direct talks with the U.S., the impact is a U.S.-Iran conflict. Any Iranian attack will result in greater retaliation by the U.S. Barnes 20 reports that Trump vowed to retaliate against Iran using its proxy forces to attack U.S. troops by, quote, going up the food chain, hinting that U.S. would directly strike Iran. Mosher 20 explains that tensions could escalate to the point that Trump could use a new line of tactical nuclear weapons to strike Iran. And Ellen 20 quantifies that this would kill 34 million people. War 20 concludes that this series of attacks and counterattacks could lead to a U.S.-Iran war. Any conflict would be devastating for two reasons. The first is that Ritter 19 quantifies that a U.S.-Iran war would kill 10, 10 million people. And Wood 20 writes that a war would draw in other countries, triggering a widening regional conflict. Second, due to investor, low investor confidence, consumer spending, and trade, the IMF concludes that the conflict reduces the GDP of nations by over 20%, and the economic impacts that in developing nations, 1% reduction in GDP increases poverty by 1.7%. Thus, we affirm. Are you ready for cross? Uh, yeah. Cool. Do you mind if I take the first question? Of course not. Will the U.S. continue to have to have military forces in countries like Afghanistan? Why does this matter? Because, like, in general, like Iran's rhetoric and the hardliners' rhetoric is that they're opposed to U.S. intervention around the world, 
So insofar as the U.S. continues to have other foreign policy that they object to, they can still uh, scapegoat the U.S., right? That's, uh, a, that's not true. B, that's not our argument. Our argument is that we're talking about hardliners in Iran are against the military presence in Iran, which is why we've seen them have a growing threat. But if you were to affirm, then the entire presence of their campaign that, oh, the U.S. is bad and the U.S. like the U.S. specifically in Iran, like in this like area is bad, goes away. And that's why our evidence can... Wait, so hardliners only say that the U.S. is bad specifically because of its policy with Iran. They don't call us the great Satan. We haven't had conflict since 1979. I mean, the problem is the U.S. presence, and we have we're, we really cite you like attacks from March about escalating like Iran proxy wars. Can I take a question? Sure. Okay, so you talk about like like peace in Palestine, right? Like how we could have peace. Like what is what's going on right now in the status quo, the neg world to fix the scenario in Palestine? We'd say that like there are ongoing attempts for peace processes. The U.S. Like, continues to put leverage to try to put pressure on Israel to try and pursue a peace process. Like, like While those right. haven't been like super successful, the only chance of ever having any kind of settlement happens when the U.S. pressures so, Israel so, to do that. So follow, a quick follow-up. So like when have these peace talks happened? I mean, like I don't have specific dates, but like I know that there have been talks about like different okay. deals. Sure, like how many and like which deals? Like there have Because you're trying to... Cause you're trying to talk about the two state solution, but you can't just come and tell me like deals vaguely, like, like what specifically are they like trying to talk about? Like there have been a lot of discussions about very different, about a lot of different scenarios for two state solutions. There's not just one specific one that's been proposed, but okay. the point is that like in general, if you ever want to have a two state solution and to have any kind of peace, it's only going to happen with us pressure. Can I ask yeah. you a question? Yeah, of course. You tell us that Trump's maximum pressure campaign is what's undermining the moderates. Does the maximum pressure campaign not also include sanctions? Uh, no. Because the presence of the, what's undermining more importantly than Trump's like presence is Trump's presence is giving rise to hardliners and hardliners are like undermining the campaign of the moderates. But once they're gone, presence physically, the moderates have no foundational base which they rely upon and run this campaign. So the moderates will then have their voice of diplomacy. Can I take a quick question? Sure. So on like your first contention, your link about expansion is jihad. So as long as like moderates are in power, like as long as like hardliners are in power with US presence, like isn't this ideology always going to exist? I mean, we'd say their ideology exists regardless of whether or not the US is present because mm -hmm. there are always going to be hardliners. And because of the fact that it's been like 50 years of, or four so years we... of the U.S. not getting along with Iran, you're not just going to fix that in one fell swoop. The U.S. is going to continue to have policies and they're going to have historical okay. differences yeah. that allow them to be scapegoated yeah. for that time. That's cross. We're going to run a little bit of prep um, and we'll start now. Okay, that was 44 seconds used. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, okay. It's gonna be straight down their case. Is everyone ready? On Iraq, we say that the US pulling out allows terrorist organizations in Iraq to commit genocide against local populations and further unstabilize the country. After US withdrawal from Iraq, Hartman reports that when the US left, terrorists like ISIS began committing genocide against local religious ethnic minority groups like the Yazidis, which number 600,000 people. The University of Minnesota explains that terrorists also committed genocide against the Shabak minority groups who faced mass displacement, abductions, and killings. Empirically, Hartman explains that these genocide forced the U.S. to return to the region and redeploy forces. There are two implications. The first is that even if we leave for a short period of time, we are going to go back, which means that there's no uniqueness. But secondly, we say that it is far worse to have a genocide than for there to be a little bit of violence against U.S. troops. 
Secondly, we say that removing U.S. presence allows for ISIS's rise in Iraq, as Karafano explains that when we pull out, terrorist groups use a power vacuum to grow stronger. Empirically, Fordham explains the withdrawal of U.S. troops helped ISIS rise to power, and to make matters worse, CNN reports that ISIS is currently gearing up to regenerate. When you pull the U.S. out of the picture, you destabilize the country way more. Then, on their next contention about Iran, a couple of responses first. Um, First, we say that the majority of tensions with Iran manifest in proxy wars like the war in Yemen, but we say that U.S. presence is critical to winning and ending those proxy wars, as military support for Saudi Arabia has been really important for them to conduct the war efforts through things like airstrikes. That's why the war is on the brink of ending, as Nazer indicates that the Houthi rebels are on the brink of losing all of their territory, and al Shabini explains that a lot of rebel leaders are defecting. But leaving the region removes the possibility of a decisive military victory and throws the entire war effort away. That's why we're cutting out and frozen. Implications are U.S. support for the coalition in the war when you. Really? Can you hear me? I can't hear. The Houthis could be winning more. Reuters there has the body government to aid. Haley? All right. We should pause, pause the round, and then can the other Westfield debater call Kaylee and just let her know that her internet is a little shaky? And then we can yeah. restart from the point that everybody last heard. Okay. I think we heard her first response. It started going off on the response to the second contention. I think she's trying to log back onto the call. Hi. I'm sorry, I got booted from the call again. That's okay. You can start with the second contention, please. Okay. Um, with all the responses to Iran. Okay, okay. I think yeah. I was around 201 when I got to, or. Yeah, you like that for me at Houthis on the brink of losing. And then they're just like, like, oh. You were at like 115 when you finished responding to contention one. Okay. Um, 115. So then if no one minds, I'm just gonna start with responding to contention two then since one of the judges said that's what she missed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Go to their second contention about Iran. We say that the majority of tensions between the U.S. and Iran are manifesting in proxy conflict, but the U.S. military support of countries like Saudi Arabia is critical for ending these conflicts, as Nazer indicates that the Houthi rebels in the war in Yemen are on the brink of losing all of their territory, and al Sharbini finds that key rebel leaders are defecting. But the U.S. pulling out removes the possibility of a military victory and throws the entire war effort away in seconds. Thus, Tobin finds that Iran will double down on their end of the war. There are two implications. First, the war is prolonged. The U.S. support for the Saudi-led coalition is the only near-term solution according to foreign affairs. But when you vote for the pro-team, the starving and many people have to wait even longer for an end to their suffering. Second, we say that the Houthis take control because with a weakened Saudi coalition, the Houthis could begin winning the war. As Reuters verifies, the Hadi government was only able to reclaim the city of Aden once the Saudi coalition began providing support. And even if it's not a solid victory, a weakened Saudi Arabia has significantly less leverage in any negotiations that happen. But that's really bad because the Houthis will fail Yemen. Baron 19 writes that whoever wins the war needs to be able to enact wide-ranging reform 
arms. But Raghavan 18 explains that the Houthis are incapable of doing this and they just perpetuate tortures, detentions, and forced disappearances, leading to more instability and conflict in the future. But then, on their link about general aggression with Iran, a couple of responses. First, Rivera 20 writes that Iran's prime objectives are promoting Shia Islam and becoming a regional hegemon. It has nothing to do with the U.S. Secondly, it's not unique because Morello explains that U.S. officials show no signs of backing down on pressure, which means that they're probably going to be increasing the sanctions. That's bad because Jewel explains that in response to Trump sanctions, Iran lashes out at our partners. Thirdly, we say that U.S. deterrence in the status quo is what's stopping Iranian aggression. As Baldur explains, that when the U.S. put an additional 20,000 troops into the Middle East to counter Iran, Iran was forced to bring their ballistic missile force down and their air defenses back down from a heightened state of readiness and reduce the level of harassment in the Strait of Hormuz. On their impact about direct war, there are two responses here. The first is that Iran isn't actually going to go to a direct war, as Holmes of the National Interest writes that they perceive that the U.S. is far stronger than them, which means that they're never going to be aggressive enough to engage. But secondly, Trump will avoid war with Iran because according to foreign policy, Americans really don't want it and it's super unpopular, which means that in a election year, Trump isn't going to do something that's going to reduce his chances of being reelected that much. Okay. Um, can I call for some cards? Yeah. Um, can I see any cards about um, Iraq, uh, Yemen war almost over, um, cards saying that Trump will increase sanctions, then cards saying Trump's not going to go to war, and then Iran won't go to war too. Wait, can you repeat that? Okay, I guess, like specifically on the Yemen war, we want to see the Houthis are on the brink of losing all their territory, key leaders are defecting, and then that the U.S. is going to increase sanctions, and then Trump will never go to war. Defecting, increase sanctions, no Trump. On sanctions, we give two pieces of, event, of evidence. The first is just that they're committed to constant pressure, and then the second is that like one of those types of pressures is um, sanctions. I can't hear you. Wait, wait could, you, could you just send both then, I guess? Okay, sure. There are two parts to the Trump card. I'm sending both. Wait, Mira, I got it. Oh, okay. Or actually, you can do it. Never mind. Sorry. Okay, just let me know when all the cards have been sent because then I'll just we can like take prep all together like at the same time. Yeah, of course. Mary, you said you sent the no Trump war stuff, right? Yeah. Okay.
Okay, it should be sent. Just let me know if you got it because it's like kind of a big block of text, so it might take a bit. Um, did you say you sent the second card? It should be an email with like four or five pieces of evidence in it. Yeah, I haven't done it yet. Okay, I can try sending it again. Yeah, it's fine. We can just see it later. I'll just start. Wait, it's now. like all of the cards you asked for. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just sent it again. It okay. says it went through. All right. I haven't gone. I haven't gone the first one. Have any of the judges gone the first one? I don't know if it's just me. Did you get the one I sent? I got. I have the one that you sent. It's. It just. I all I see is like a web cache URL thing. That's all I see. Yeah. Wait, one yeah. Of is from Mira, not from. I got one from Mira, not from yeah. uh, Kaylee. Yeah. Same. Yeah. yeah, mine should be coming through. It says it was sent. So. I can try it again. That's but. fine. It's, uh. Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. So we'll take prep starting. That was 45 seconds. Okay, so order is going to be frontlining, like responding to their responses from last speech, and then just going down their case. Everybody ready? Okay. Time starts. Now, starting off on Iraq, they read this response about terrorism that doesn't actually respond to our argument about the Iraqi militias in the U.S. escalating conflict right now. However, still, I'll respond to the response. On the response, Fordham 15 of NPR asserts that in actuality, there are two other main causes for the rise of ISIS in 2011 that aren't U.S. withdrawal. First, there were massive Sunni Shia divides that resulted from the U.S. intervening in the first place and overthrowing the government in the first place. These divides caused the repression of the Sunni people that ultimately caused the rise of ISIS. The U.S. caused the problem in the first place. The second reason is that right after the U.S. left Iraq, Syria coincidentally broke out into a massive civil war, which only exacerbated the instability created by the U.S. and also allowed for the formation of ISIS. None of this had anything to do with the benefits of the U.S. in the region. In fact, the actual cause of the original instability is the U.S. themselves. But now on to our sec the responses to our second contention about Iran. They say that the U.S. is key to ending proxy wars, but they only literally give you the one example of ending the Yemen war right now, which has lasted over five years and killed hundreds of thousands of people already. Bazi 18 actually writes that the U.S.'s continued military support of Saudi Arabia has only emboldened Saudi Arabia to continue the war. Their, their one card that says the Houthis have almost lost is literally from last year, January, but the war is still 
still going on even after more than a year. So clearly it's not almost done. And the U.S. is actually making the problem a lot worse. But then they make the really critical mistake when they say that Iran will always be aggressive whether or not the U.S. is there. This also takes out all of their offense because this means that Iran will even be aggressive when the U.S. is there and provoke conflict when the U.S. is there. This is true as they don't contend with the fact that we tell you that right now like tensions are escalating. We tell you that in January, Iran launched missiles in March, an Iranian proxy, but not Iran itself, killed U.S. troops. I argue that the point at which Iran directly kills U.S. troops is coming soon. This is really critical as Rome 20 writes that Trump will only escalate if Iran itself directly kills U.S. lives because otherwise it will look bad for him to the voters. However, while Iran will always try to provoke us, whether or not the U.S. is there, the affirmative is the only side that prevents escalation into something bigger because if there are no U.S. troops in the region, then they literally can't escalate. But now onto their case, starting off with an overview. Ashford 18 reports that right now the Arab Gulf is underbalanced because countries prioritize ideological factors over security and alliance formation. This is because Sweeney 20 explains that the U.S. presence has emboldened those under its security guarantee to act aggressively, knowing that we will protect them, which is why they don't form regional security alliances with each other. Kamek 18 concludes that as a result, instability in the Gulf is inevitable unless regional alliances are created. The formation of region alliances, regional alliances absent U.S. presence allows for long-term stability as Velasco 13 writes that regional organizations are 6.7 times more likely to create long-term peace. Basically, if the U.S. leaves, these countries will be forced to turn to each other, which increases peace and stability. This is a direct response to their first contention about Iran because we still have deterrence, we still have stability, even if the U.S. leaves, it's just that it's 6.7 times better. On to their second contention, about Israel. They literally don't provide you with any solvency. They don't tell you how peace is happening right now. They literally tell you that Netanyahu is in power right now, and they don't tell you any probability that he's going to lose power in their world. In fact, where the U.S. is present right now, the Center for Constitutional Rights reports that Israel's current policies towards the Palestinian people would constitute a form of genocide, as they range from a half-century repeated military assaults on Gaza and official Israeli statements expressly favoring the elimination of Palestinians. This is happening with you U.S. presence right now. In fact, U.S. presence is a region. Kind of 19 writes that Netanyahu stays in power because of his strong support from the U.S. In fact, Tisdale 20 writes that a U.S. military withdrawal from the Gulf would undermine a, the Trump-backed nationalist hard right in Israel and allow for a centrist coalition to broker a peaceful, equitable two-state solution with Palestine that would solve for all the conflict right now. We are the side that solves best, which is why you vote AF. Um, before Cross, can I see the evidence about Netanyahu staying in power because of Trump? Yeah. Do you want Do you want just that evidence, or also the one that says if we leave, it undermines them? Uh, both. Okay. Thanks. I sent both. Okay. Um, Are you ready for cross? Yep. Do you mind if I take the first question? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about the Sweeney Turkey right at the top of the case, right? You said that regional organizations solve better. Yeah. So what kind of organizations are those? Like stuff like the GCC? Um, not exactly, no. They're just like alliances between countries in the region. 
So can you give me examples of alliances that would form and how they would solve? I mean, I would say like there are none right now that are like explicitly security, like in nature. Uh, I would argue that probably like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, like UAE would all like form regional. I mean, like the GC. Well, first off, the Saudis are already aligned with the UAE, but also yeah, like, no, but the they, no, it's about like security agreements. Like, the GCC is meant to give them some sort of security guarantee, right? Like okay, so what does the GCC do then? Well, that would be my point, right? Like we say that in the status quo, you've seen that these countries have tried to make alliances and they just haven't I mean, worked. Like, or okay, are, can, I, can I explain the distinction? Sure. So basically, the GCC is like economic and political in nature, right? It's not about like security or like defense. We're saying that that's because right now the U.S. is the security guarantor to all of its allies in the region. However, if the U.S. were to leave, now suddenly these people need security, right? So that okay, means so they would form security like, guarantees. Why is the militaristic cooperation between the Saudis and the UAE in the war in Yemen not something that links in? Because that's not a security guarantee. Like military cooperation is distinct from a security guarantee. A security guarantee would be something like a mutual defense treaty where they do like, they conduct like defense, like, like military drills together. Can Does I ask you a question? Say We've that been on this for like a minute. 30. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Right. So um, on Israel, right? How do you solve in the neg world? We say that currently, like, although there's high levels of violence, we say that when you vote AF, the levels get worse, right? Like, we're not, so, say, we're not claiming that we're solving for the genocide in the status quo. We say a couple of warrants for why when we vote for you, like, more people No, wait, die, no, you right? read some stuff saying that you destroy any chance of peace in the AF. No, no, no. So like, what chance of peace links, do you have in the right? world? The first one is that U.S. withdrawal creates the perception of insecurity, which is the root cause of all of the hardline policies in Israel. Like historically, Israeli politicians like jump on times of insecurity and use them as an excuse to justify more hardline policies. But second, we say that like Netanyahu's like chances are fairly unstable in the status quo, right? Like they keep on having more and more elections to try and like see if like he's going to so be in power. Or do you know what like Netanyahu's like campaign is centered around? His whole campaign, like slogan, is that he's really close to the U.S. and he can sway U.S. opinion. So if the U.S. were to leave the region and say we're not like dealing with this problem anymore, wouldn't that hurt his chances and be a lot no, better solvency than what you have Netanyahu right now? Netanyahu is like based on so much more than that, right? Like he also says that like Israel faces an existential threat. He's the only one okay. who can solve for it with hardline policies. That's him. Um, we're gonna run we running crap starting now. Okay, that was a minute and 20 seconds. So we have 50 remaining. Um, just as an off time roadmap, it's gonna start on the Iraq and Yazidis argument on their side of the flow. Then we're gonna talk about Iran and then Israel. Is everyone ready? Cool. Then let's begin. There are three main issues in this round. The first is going to be on Iraq and the Yazidis. Because Kayla tells you something that's super important in rebuttal, which is from Hartman, which tells you that when the U.S. pulled out historically, that gave terror groups like ISIS the ability to commit genocides against the Yazidis. 
who saw us from the University of Minnesota that this extended to other ethnic groups as well. The reason that's really important, that it's really important that they don't respond to this is that one, when we saw this genocide be committed, it meant that the United States had to go back into Iraq and was redeployed. That inherently means that all of their impacts are unique because the U.S. is going to return to the region. But secondly, that means you're in their world, you're going to see a genocide be committed. This is uniquely really important because it affects 600,000 Yazidis, but also because there's nobody else who's going to be there to protect them. They want to tell you about like regional alliances, but we saw historically that it has failed to protect these ethnic minorities because they fundamentally don't care about them. Even if this is also going to outweigh the Palestinian genocide, because historically we've seen that Palestine has other people to has other countries come in on behalf of them and defend them. They have their own countries. The Yazidis are utterly defenseless. This is the most important is you can vote for us in this round because America is needed to do this. Then they tell you like ISIS is caused by the U.S. Remember the Carafano evidence tells you that the reason, even if people are aggressive, the reason ISIS was able to get power was because the U.S. left a power vacuum. That's really important that we've seen this happen historically because even if you believe that we started the problem, the only way to solve it is to have the United States. And the United States presence is going to be really important to prevent them from committing genocide. Then, the second issue in this round is Iran. You can also vote for us here because they agree with the Rivera evidence that Iran is inherently aggressive anyway. However, the Baldor evidence tells you that U.S. deters aggression from ever escalating into full war. They try and tell you like Trump is going to escalate if troops are killed. The problem is they don't respond to the Holmes evidence, which tells you that Iran doesn't actually want to start a war. They know that if they kill American troops, this is going to happen. They're not going to do it. Trump won't escalate because the foreign policy evidence tells you that it would be political suicide in its own election year. But because, but then. They try and tell you that, they, that regional alliances are going to solve for this. But remember the Orango evidence tells you that we saw when the US pulled out, Ar Iran was able to move into Iraq. Iraq wasn't able to deter this. This is really problematic because the Abdul Razak evidence tells you that they tried to commit ethnic cleansings when they were in Iraq. We've seen that historically it has failed. We were going to win this argument on probability. But then the third place you can vote for us is off of Israel. They try and tell you that, er, that their own evidence says that Iran would increase securitization. Even if like they win, or hardliners like Netanyahu will lose power, their own evidence implies that any centrist candidate is inherently going to be more aggressive. They don't interact with our warranting, which tells you that historically Israel responds to security threats with increased securitization, regardless of the politician. Theirs is very specific to like one president. We don't know what's going to happen in the election, but because of Iran's, or Israel's history of persecution, they, fear, they feel like they need to lash out and increase their securitization and aggression when they're aggressive. That's why you're going to see more violence in their world. Okay, we're going to run prep time. Um, I got the timer out. I got the timer. I got timer. Okay. You're starting.
Okay, uh, we have 15 seconds left. Uh, so the order is going to be Iraq, Iran, and then um, Israel. But on the Iran, I'm going to start on their Iran and link that to our Iran arguments. Okay. Is everybody ready? Start on Iraq is the easiest place to sign your ballot for a couple of reasons. They just give you responses in summary that don't ever interact with any of the responses Michael gives you. They just extend the responses saying that when the U.S. pulled out, like we created a genocide and like the Yazidi like genocide. But the, the problem is they don't respond to Ford and 15 who gives you two reasons of why there's even terrorism like in the first place. The first is because the U.S. intervention itself causes split in ideology, which is causing the conflict. And the second is that we see that like there's other problems like the civil war, like in Syria, which exacerbate the crisis. The implication here is that uniquely the U.S. is what's been making it worse as an actor. So pulling out isn't the problem. It's the fact that we were even there in the first place. But even then, they don't even interact with their Iraq argument at all. They don't completely misrepresent it. They completely misunderstand it. It's so easy to evaluate here. This is our argument. Our memory evidence explains that Iraqi militias are escalating tensions. And the implication of this is that U.S. deterrence is failing right now insofar as the Iraqi militia and the U.S. are attacking right now. This is because our Copper 20 evidence states that these militias want to provoke the U.S. into a greater response, therefore forcing Iraq to evict the U.S. Smith, uh, therefore forcing Iraq to evict, the, as U.S. Smith 20 explains, that uh, Iraqi militias want the U.S. out is because they believe that the U.S. presence is a form of U.S. expansionism. This results in a U.S.-Iraq conflict, which Nicholas quantifies would kill 2.4 million people. You can weigh this on time frame. Time is of the essence because Mazzetti evidence uh, indicates that the Pentagon has already begun the creation of war papers for a U.S. conflict in Iraq. But fortunately, when you affirm, you stop a conflict right now saving 2.4 million lives outweighing on time frame because the Mazzetti evidence indicates that an Iraq conflict in the U.S. is happening right now. We also outweigh on scope because our love luck evidence indicates that a U.S.-Iraq conflict would induce cyclical violence, which devastates the region. But then let's go to Iran. The reason they lose Iran is on our overview, which goes very poorly responded to. They first said that when the U.S. pulled out, like, like Iraq or filled in, and like Iran filled in in Iraq, that's not our argument. Our argument is on a larger scope. When there is no U.S. presence in the region at all, these countries will force and turn to regionalism and regional alliances. The reason we don't say that right now is because they support their own ideologies because they're backed up by the U.S. and they just go like support the U.S. That's why we see that the Yemen war has literally never ended because Saudi Arabia is just super backed up by the U.S. They don't come to the table to talk. But then we uniquely do that because Kamek tells you that right now, under the given status quo, instability is inevitable. But the only way we solve this is through regional like talks. That's why Velasco concludes that on net, regional alliances are 6.7 times more likely to form and have more likely to be better in the long term than like the right now relying on external sources like the US. That's why we're also winning there. That's why this takes out any of their offense on like power vacuum because this literally shows that right now US containment in the status quo is failing. Then let's go on Israel. On Israel, they say that our evidence talks about securitization. It literally doesn't call for it. They literally admit in crossfire that they don't solve for the current genocide of the Palestinian people, and they don't respond to the Tisdall evidence who tells you that a U.S. military withdrawal would weaken the hard right in Israel and allow moderates to broker a two-state solution that would create lasting peace. They're going to tell you to vote for them because they're the only side with a quote-unquote risk of helping like the problem. We would say, no, we're the only side. But even then, the, the, their third response is that we only talk about one president. That's because their second link is literally about Netanyahu, Netanyahu election. We link into the their argument better than them. That's why we would see that because like also like on Iran, like don't let them come up here and read your new arguments on in first final focus because we control the direction of the link because we say that right now containment is failing. So Iran will always be aggressive. They concede this. Are you ready for ground? Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I take the first question? Uh, of course not. Okay. So you tell us that like regional alliances are going to create stability. Insofar uh, as that's okay. true, why when we withdrew, did we see what? that the regional alliance that formed between Iraq and Iran resulted in an ethnic cleansing? Uh, okay, so on that, so the wait, argument Michael, is... Wait, your phone, your phone. Oh, wait, sorry. So the, on that, the argument, the distinction that Trace makes in this summary is that withdrawing from one country is different than withdrawing from literally all of our allies in the region. Because if you withdraw from just Iraq, obviously they're going to turn to Iran and we'd agree that Iran is probably a bad actor. However, if we withdraw from all of our allies in the region, at the same time, all of them will have to form regional security agreements, which are 6.7 times more likely. Wait, like, hang like, on. Like, Can effective. Clarify? Like, that's our warranty. Why? I don't know. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like, why w mm -hmm. would they not have turned to these countries if they if they're okay. more ideologically aligned? Why would they not have turned to these countries instead of Iran? Yeah, so great question. So basically, if we only withdrew from Iraq, 
So basically, your evidence is we withdrew from Iraq, but we didn't withdraw from like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, all these other countries. So in that way, only Iraq had an incentive to form a security alliance, while Saudi Arabia and the other countries did not have an incentive. As a result, obviously, Iran, who we both agree is a bad actor who wants to like expand their hegemony in the region, stepped in and was like, hey, I'll step in for you. However, our argument is that if we also withdraw from Saudi Arabia and these other places, then these other countries will have incentives I mean, to form regional like, alliances with each other. There are some levels of alliances, I'd say it's a lot more likely yeah, but, that Iran yeah. just, that Iraq just thought that it wasn't sufficient uh, to protect them, and that's why they turned to Iran, but we've been on this for a while. Do you want to ask okay. a question? Yeah, can I ask you a question? So basically, on our argument about Iraqi militias, how is your response about ISIS resurgence any re way responsive to our argument about Iraqi militias escalate? Because two reasons. First is that what the Hartman evidence tells you is that some form of violence will re-erupt when we leave, which means that we're going to be redeployed to Iraq. We've seen this happen no, in the past, yeah, which makes he, your argument naive. No, but the but second he, reason is that because that like okay, even, can I explain the argument? Because you haven't really responded to it this entire round. So argument wait, no, like, is that we are though, because we're no, telling because, you that no, because it doesn't have to do with like terrorism. The it argument doesn't, doesn't, is that right terrorism. now. No, there but are it Iraqi has to do with true presence in the region, right? Yeah, that's the yeah. point. The point. Yeah, that's so what, what we're telling you is that because there will be a resurgence of terrorism, American troops will be redeployed into Iraq. Okay, that means a, so. a, a, that's really problematic because durable fiat, like you can't just say we leave and then we come back because then as the affirmative, I can advocate that we're going to- literally never said this in the round. We've been saying no, like, this You're bringing this up new right now though. Like this is new right now. Like, no, this we've been reading this since rebuttal. This is really abusive, but also B, that's not the argument. The argument which Kent 20 really empirically like tells you is that once we withdraw, Iraqi militias will stop because their main goal is to get like the US presence out of there. That's the entire argument that goes uncontested. You guys just read a bunch of terrorism terms which aren't even responsive to the actual argument. No, like, the argument cause... for why they're going back isn't because they're going to be fighting the Iraqi militias. It's going to be that there's a genocide occurring and the U.S. generally well, likes would... to stop genocides. So, so, that's why would there be a geno so why would there and be a genocide? we're going to run the remaining 52 okay. seconds of prep. Starting now. Okay. Okie doke. Is everyone good? Okay. Start on the argument about Iraq. Their messy cross application of their response saying that the US created terror groups is silly for two reasons. First, they say themselves that the war was, uh, that terrorism is a result of like religious tensions which have nothing to do with the US. But secondly, it doesn't interact with the argument. We say that it doesn't matter if the US created the problem, it doesn't change that it's already been created. We can't undo it. So the only thing that we can do is attempt to solve. And empirically, when the US pulls out of the region, solvency has gotten worse. Even even if you buy that voting for them makes these groups slightly weaker, they still have the capability to conduct genocides. That's what the Hartman evidence empirically tells you, which is that when we pulled out, ISIS started massacring 600,000 Yazidi people, which forced us to go back into the region. The implication that they never respond to until Grand Crossfire is that this non-uniques their argument because Hartman says that when genocides occurred, we go back which means that you non-unique all of their stuff about Iraq not liking U.S. troops. But we say that on probability, we prove to you that there's a historical precedent for this genocide happening, and on magnitude, you're eliminating an entire culture. That's a place to sign your ballot. Then on Iran, they say that alliance is solved, but they don't actually respond to the stuff that we give you, where we tell you that in the status quo, Baldur said that we are containing Iran by forcing them to bring their military down from a state of readiness. But they also don't respond to the fact that Iran wants power, but it's not so suicidal, which is why the response we give you in rebuttal and Mira extends says that they're never actually going to be aggressive enough to get into a full-scale conflict with the U.S. 
on Israel. We say that even if Netanyahu loses power, the government is still going to be more aggressive in these, uh, at, on a whole. Prefer our evidence is a broad analysis of patterns of Israeli behavior rather than just one cherry-picked example. It's not about Netanyahu, it's about Israel's actions as a whole. This Sardo evidence says they always use politics of insecurity to justify more aggressive measures. Even if they buy their argument that Israel is bad right now, it gets so much worse when you vote for him. Them. That's empirically proven we're the only team that gives you a broad historical analysis. We're on our remaining 15 seconds. Oh, jinx. Uh -huh. Okay, so the order of the speech is going to be really quickly on regional security, then Iraq, and then Israel. Okay, everybody ready? Start off on regional security agreements. They dropped this in final focus, so you can extend all the evidence that we read telling you that right now, these Gulf states don't form alliances because of the U.S. security guarantee. However, if the U.S. were to leave, it would form regional security agreements that are 6.7 times more effective at the at creating long-term peace. This links into all of their impacts about Iranian deterrence and all of their impacts about stability in the region because these regional agreements are on net better. But then on to Iraq, they keep on talking about terrorism. And in final focus, they try really hard to link it to our Iraqi militia argument. However, the problem with terrorism is they, the Fordham 15 evidence that we read you goes uncontested this entire round. We tell you that the resurgence of ISIS that they tried to give as an empirical example was actually due to two alternative causes. The first is that Sunni Shia divides caused by US presence to help Help fuel the resurgence of ISIS. But the second one that they never respond to tells you that the Syrian civil war occurred at the same time, which caused instability. They never respond to this. So you can see that there are alternative causes for this sort of ISIS resurgence. However, what we tell you is that right now, Iraqi militias are provoking the US to get them out. And the US is about to send in troops right now. They concede all of this evidence insofar as we tell you that this would kill 2.4 million people and destabilize the entire region. I would argue that this is what would allow for a resurgence of ISIS right now in their world. We link into their terrorism argument a lot better than them, and they never contest the fact that this is happening right now, and the only way we solve is that the U.S. leaves. They just try to classify this, like, terrorism argument that they, again, never properly defend. But then, so that's why you can vote for us because two, we have, we, we link into their own argument because if you destabilize the region in Iraq, then that leads to the resurgence of ISIS and all of their impacts. But then on Israel, they just keep extending through ink, saying that, saying new analysis and final focus, that their evidence is a lot more broad. So that's why you prefer it. But then they tell you that it gets a lot worse in their world, however, in our world. But they literally admit that genocide is happening right now in their world. It can't get much worse, which is why the Tisdo evidence tells you that a U.S. military withdrawal would weaken Netanyahu who in like the hard right because because then he wouldn't have the u.s support to re-campaign on which is why it would allow for a two-state solution that solves for this genocide for all these reasons vote app nice round good debate y'all good debate air um, handshake yeah air handshakes <laughs>
we are still waiting for one more judge. Yes, it says the panel decision is incomplete. Yeah. So mine is in. I'm guessing, Chad, you already put yours in. Uh, yes, mine is yeah. in. Ballot did I give? Hmm? I think ballot did I? Bobby? Huh? I put Chad in a ballot. Oh, is the round over? I have no idea. Oh, then the round's over. The round's over. Okay, the decision is in. Um, so congratulations to uh, the debaters in the round. Uh, the decision was a 2-1 for the pro from Foothill. Um, I can go first because I squirreled. Um, basically, I yeah. voted on the uh, genocide impact um, as being the, in my opinion, best comparative weighing that was done in the round. Um, I thought that the first response, the defensive response, wasn't very persuasive uh, because it was just like a card about like what causes terrorism from 2015. Um, and it, to me, was responded by the summary and final focus analysis that even if it's true that America created many of the drivers for things like conflict and genocide. It doesn't change what America should do in the context of preventing those from happening in the future. Um, then I was probably more sympathetic to the neg impact calculus, I think, than the other two judges, um, that <clears throat> if America were to uh, perceive a genocide in Iraq, then it would come back into the region. Um, I think that you essentially in Grand Cross, like had a good response to it, um, which is that uh, that affirmative gets durable fiat, but it wasn't really in final focus. And I think it was developed a little bit too late. Then the thing that I think that you win cleanest um, for the um, pro in this round is your argument about regional alliances. Um, but I agree with the con that those regional alliances are unlikely to happen if America is in the region. I think that the pro could have done a much better job. Yeah, the yeah, the con could have done, sorry, a much better job of explaining that a lot better though. Um, Cause I felt like I had to intervene a little bit there to apply that re-intervention turn to um, the regional alliances. But the pro, in my opinion, could have done a better job of like weighing those out. Like 
why are regional alliances and, re and a reduction of instability more important than uh, the genocide impact? I but I'll let the other. Mm -hmm. I have a question on that. Is that fine? Yeah. So do you so think you if we cross apply the regional alliance overview to the implication saying that like on net, like since US, like it, since our argument was that US is the one that's causing this problem, like that's the forehand like empirics, then do you think if we made the implication that that's why if we leave these no form regional alliances, uh, regional alliances and like security guarantees, specifically like military kind of packs that will prevent uprisings of like and resurgence of terrorist groups and we could have won the internal link to genocide? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think that I you could have implicated it a lot better because it was a drop turn that I think um, could have done more for you on the flow. Uh, thank you and a great round from everybody. Okay, shall we go next? Oh, wait, sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, do you think cross applying the re-intervention turn would take out other AF offense? So I, when I voted, I said that it did, mm -hmm. um, which is why I voted for you. Um, but I don't think that you make that as explicit as you should be making it in the round. And so I think that maybe to like win the other two judges ballots that you need to like make that much more explicit and be doing a better job of making it persuasive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I think you're probably good summary Chad and, and this is probably the difference between parent judges and a tech judge. Um, for me, I don't think Middle East is never going to be a peaceful area. So I was looking for imminency and a probability of an improvement. I felt like the Israel was a wash for me. It's very difficult to predict the behavior there with or without uh, US. And I did not think that Iran would go for a full scale war and frontal with US. And without the US presence, I felt moderates may have a chance. Um, on genocide, um, uh, that, that, that was a little bit hard for me to get to a conclusion. Um, and uh, the ISIS resurgence argument, there were two reasons that uh, Khan did not clash on very well. So that kind of went through. And the two other arguments that stood out for me on the regional collaboration, I felt it's, it's, it's an assumption. It's still an assumption. I did not get any uh, precedence on it but the pro made it plausible. But what I really voted off of is the Iraqi militia. That, that argument went uncontested fairly throughout the round. And there was a sense of imminency to that. Um, and that, that's finally what um, my uh, vote came down to. Um. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I am a lay judge, so I will not be fancy in my terms, but both the things did amazing. First of all, it was a very tough call for me. I voted for Pro because of their regional alliance uh, uh, evidence and the fact that they gave a sense of hope to the region. Secondly, I agree with them that uh, the rise of ISIS was because of Shia Sunni divide, which was because of US intervention. And then uh, again, their point about US supporting Saudi Arabia has emboldened them, rang a bell with me. Um, I would say that they were not too strong, Pro was not too strong on the Israel. Maybe in the next round, you should work on that. But uh, um, I think you did a better job of convincing me that U.S. Bay is, uh, let me put it nicely, uh, U.S. presence is increasing militia in that area. That was it. Good luck to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for judging. Thank you all for judging. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank, Thank you. Good luck to you guys.